And today we have Joyce Maynard and Kirthana Ramasetti. And Kirthana is going to go first. Um, she earned her MFA in creative writing from Emerson College and has had her work published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and other publications. Her debut novel, Dava Shastri's Last Day, was a Good Morning America book club pick, a most anticipated in fall 2021 by Time, The Washington Post, Bustle, Goodreads, and, and um, an Indie Next pick in Publishers Marketplace, Buzz Book for Fall Winter 21, and was also longlisted for the 2021 Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. And it is currently in development for a television series for HBO Max. Her second novel, Advica and the Hollywood Wives, will be published in April 2023, and she lives in New York City. So I'll call you up first, and then... Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, so my debut novel, Dava Shastri's Last Day, which is now out in paperback, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, it was inspired by my time as an entertainment journalist. So I used to work at the New York Daily News, and in that job, one of the things we had to do often was cover the deaths of celebrities. So anytime we had to write obituaries, so one of the first things we do is go on social media and look at the real-time reaction to this news. And every time I had to do this, I was always very moved by the tributes and the sadness and the fond remembrances that people would share, whether they knew the person who had passed away, if they were fans, colleagues, etc. And I always put this weird thought in my head, which is, do other famous people see this and wonder what will be said about them when their time comes? So this thought stayed with me for a couple of years. And then one day I heard the song from Hamilton, the musical, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. And that song always moved me because it's about the idea that none of us are in control of how we're remembered after we're gone, but it's largely in the hands of the people we leave behind. So I had a thought. What if a person was so obsessed with their obituaries and how they'd be remembered after, after they were gone that they actually had their death announced early just so they can read the coverage? And that's how this novel was born. And I really wanted to meet the person who would be so obsessed and so want to know what would be said about them that they would do this something so audacious such as this. I wanted to meet who this person was. And also have her come to the realization that, you know, no matter how I'll be remembered, ultimately it's about my relationship with myself and my relationship with my family. So my novel is about Dava Shastri. She's an Indian American billionaire who's always been obsessed with her legacy. And then when she learns that she has terminal cancer, she decides to announce her death early so she can read her obituaries. But this backfires on her um, when her two biggest secrets are revealed to the world. And so with the limited time she has left, she must make amends with her four adult children and come to terms with the decisions she has made throughout her life. So, <laughs> yes, it's a very interesting idea, I know, but I was really, really interested in the idea of exploring the idea of family and legacy in this novel. It's actually my third attempt in about 20 years to write a novel. So when I decided to write this book, I'm like, well, let me make it my kitchen sink book in the, in the sense that I'm going to throw into it everything that I'm really interested in and obsessed by. So that's family, legacy, pop culture, celebrity gossip, and music. So music was always really important to me when I was growing up. I always like to say that reading and writing were like oxygen to me. Like it was just like breathing. I didn't even think twice about it. But music was different for me. It came to me like for many of us when I was a teenager. And so listening to music was really special to me because whereas books gave me a path towards exploring other people, countries, time periods, cultures, etc., music for the first time made me go inward and think about what do I want? What are my dreams? What are my ambitions? And so I decided to give that journey to my main character, Dava, and see how music would fuel her ambitions and give her the strength to go after her dreams. So I'm gonna actually read an excerpt from my novel today. It is a letter in the form of a mixtape. So my protagonist, Dava, meets her future husband, Arvid, at the Peace Corps, and she wants, to, she wants him to know who she is and how she grew up and what her life was like growing up as the only child of Indian immigrants in a small town in Arizona. So she decides to communicate her life story in the form of a mixtape. So she puts together a bunch of songs on a tape and then writes them a letter and see, shows how these songs illustrate her life to date. And the mixtape is called Favorite Thing, and in parentheses, a biography of sorts. 
And here is her letter to her future husband. The first song, Academy Fight Song by Mission of Burma. My mission statement in me versus that fucking suburb, AKA Calliston, Arizona. It reminded me not to take shit from anyone in that stupid town, especially people in high school. They called me a poo for as long as I can remember. During my freshman year, they said it to my face. By senior year, they wouldn't dare. By then, I had established a reputation of taking no shit. They had learned to stay far from me. Next song, Once in a Lifetime, Talking Heads. You called it the lightning flash, when music was no longer background noise, but a sudden magical resonance, and nothing was ever the same. This was mine, tw 12th birthday, New Walkman, $20 gift certificate to Sam Goodies, bicycling at sunset, and then boom. Next song, We Got the Beat, The Go-Go's. <laughs> the Go-Go's changed everything for me. Post lightning flash, when I started listening to music, like really listening, it seemed bands who write their own songs and play their own instruments are dudes. Uh, while I liked Madonna and Whitney, I respected bands. And if any woman were in a band, they had to play feminine instruments, you know, like the tambourine or piano. You know, like the Archies, I know they were fictional, or Fleetwood Mac. And then I saw a music video for We Got the Beat late at night on some sort of MTV ripoff channel to see all women on stage playing guitar and drums and bass and no one banished to the keyboards it was a revelation. They weren't trying to be pretty. They were dancing, sweating, and having a glorious time. To know women were making music of this made me feel less alone. They shifted the world for me, opening a door I keep walking through. <sighs> Next song, Cannonball by The Breeders. My birth name is actually Deva, D-E-V-A. It's a unisex name because my mom had a lot of trouble getting pregnant. And when she finally did, my parents wanted my gender to be a surprise. And then I was misspelled Dava, D-A-V-A, on my birth certificate. And I like it so much, it's unique. No one in the world has my name because it's not supposed to exist. <laughs> did you know Oprah's name it was supposed to be spelled Orpa, O-R-P-A-H? I was misspelled on her birth certificate and so she kept it and then created a whole empire with a name that's wholly her own. It's gonna be the same for me and I'm gonna hit the world like a cannonball. Next song, Happy House, Susie and the Banshees. Here's a family portrait. Let's title it, Shastri in Real Life, 1986 to 1992. A father and daughter arguing and the mother watching with sad, pleading eyes. When I discovered this song, I felt vindicated. My sense of alienation was valid and would not pretend otherwise. I turned this up full blast in my room, my version of a primal scream. Next song, Norwegian Wood, The Beatles. My dad didn't understand why I spent so much of my time and waitressing money at record stores. So I thought if I played him this song, which has a star on it, then he would start to get it. I made a mixtape of songs to play when he was teaching me to drive. And when Norwegian Wood came on, he smiled. After the song ended, he rewound the tape. I was so excited, I told him endless facts about George Harrison and Ravi Shankar, and how it was the first time an Indian instrument had been featured on a pop song. And he interrupted me with, you think I haven't heard of the Beatles? <laughs> and then we both laughed so loud and so long. I wonder if he ever thinks back to that time as much as I do. Next song, A Design for, Li a Design for Life, Manic Street Preachers. Did your family suffer at all from the 1987 crash, or was that just an American thing? I should note that her husband, Arvid, is from Sweden. My dad has a lot invested in stocks, so we were hurt when the market crashed. I was a freshman in high school when this happened, and I think at one point my parents were afraid we'd lose the house. Somehow my dad was able to get it together financially, but he seemed haunted afterward, like he was forever afraid the floor would give out underneath him. Seeing my parents stress so much changed me in a big way. I decided I'd pay my own way for college so I could take the burden off of them, which also meant I would be under no obligation to fulfill their dreams for me. They would have over, no say over where I went or what I studied, and ultimately who I dated and what I did for a living. All my choices and mistakes would be fully my own. This song's soaring chorus reminds me of that light bulb moment and the strength of my resolve my personal declaration of independence. Next song, Favorite Thing by The Replacements. 
the inspiration for this mixtape's title and how I felt about the mats from 1991 to 1993. I still love them a lot, but for those two years, I was saturated and infatuated. Final song, Sunken Treasure by Wilco. This song brings back how I felt living in fake suburb, yearning and lonely, not just among the white people either, even within the small group of Indian families that made up our community, the only people my parents socialized with. We all lived in the same neighborhood called Paradise Valley. It's 10 blocks made up of tract homes, beige walls, pink stucco roofs next to a golf course. The Shastris were decidedly middle class, not poor, but not wealthy enough to make, take overseas vacations. We did the American classics, Disneyland, Grand Canyon, Mount Rushmore, Yellowstone, the Jaga shit, the Raja Blas, the Pra Poops, and the Shahs. Wait, they weren't actually so bad, so I don't have a bitchy nickname for them. They got to travel to India and Hawaii and go on safaris in Africa. Their dads in the family were all doctors, which is why I think my dad wanted me to be one, so I'd be afraid to, so I'd be able to afford the things he could not. And so every Friday and Saturday night, we'd rotate going to each other's houses, and the dads would smoke cigarettes on the patio and talk about cricket, and the moms would cook and gossip in the kitchen, and the kids would go upstairs and watch TV. They purposely cracked jokes in Hindi because they knew I wouldn't understand. My parents spoke Telugu, but I never learned that language either. I was also the youngest, so they either treated me as invisible or as their servant. Can you get me some Coke? Thanks. It was one thing to feel isolated from the white kids, but to feel iced out by these kids who looked like me was devastating, and it fueled my desire to escape. The last lines of Sinking Treasure mean the world to me. I'm too embarrassed to write them here because they are so earnest and speak to some essential truth about me I can't say out loud. But I wish this song existed when I lived in Calliston. I'm glad I found it after. <laughs> So I get asked a lot what Dov and I have in common. And obviously I always say we're both billionaires, which is not true. <laughs> but we do have music in common. So one of the interesting things I did when writing this novel is I decided to set it 20 years in the future. And the only reason I did that, again, this is my debut novel. I didn't know if anyone would ever read it. I was writing this really for myself. So I set it 20 years in the future into the 2040s because that way Dava and I would have the same musical tastes. She would also be a child of the 80s and 90s. Um, but one of the most special parts of writing this book was the fact, um, so in the novel, Dava has four adult children, and when they learn what their mother has done, the idea that she has announced her death early so she can read her obituaries, but also she has a terminal illness, and she's dying in a matter of days. And so when these two secrets about her come out in the news coverage um, around her death, they realize they don't know their mother at all, and they're kind of horrified that the person they always thought of her as was wildly different from the human being she actually is. So what's important to me as I was writing this book, actually was like, well, I don't want to be in these children's position and not know my parents or my family. So I actually had a lot of conversations with my parents and my grandmother and my aunt, who's here tonight, and just asked them questions. Because I want to make sure, like, I want there to be a point where I don't realize I know my family members as people and their lives and their stories. And so one of the most special things about writing this book and the reaction to it is uh, that people say to me, I read your book, and then actually have these conversations with my family, wanting to touch base about, you know, not just knowing each other and knowing our stories, but also having conversations about end of life care and what decisions we're going to make. So that's really special to me. The other thing that's special to me is the whole idea of legacy itself. So this book started out as about being about, for me, celebrity and ego, but really came, after writing it, after having discussions with my family too, I realized it's not just about that. It's about how we're all connected, and legacy is a big part of that. So when, during my time as an entertainment journalist, I used to think the concept of legacy belonged to the bold-faced names. The people would get their obituaries published in the New York Times, like Dava. But in writing this book, I realized Legacy is a concept that belongs to all of us because we all make an impact, we all make a mark. And one of the lessons that Dava learns is not just thinking about the impact she made in the outside world, but how she impacted her family and her children and her grandchildren. And that's a lesson that's taught to me too. I have a legacy, we all have a legacy, and it's something to be mindful of, not just towards the end of our lives, but as we live our lives day by day. Thank you so much.
And now I'm gonna, we're going to have Joyce Maynard come up. Um, Joyce is a native of New Hampshire and began publishing her stories in magazines when she was 13 years old. She first came to national attention with the publication of her New York Times cover story, An 18-Year-Old Looks Back on Life, in 1972, when she was a freshman at Yale. Since then, she's been a reporter and columnist for the New York Times and a syndicated newspaper columnist whose domestic affairs column appeared in over 50 papers nationwide, a regular con contributor to NPR and national magazines, including Vogue, the New York Times Magazine, and many more. And she's also a longtime performer with The Moth. She's the author of 18 books, including the New York Times bestselling novel, Labor Day and To Die For, which were both adapted to films, and Under the Influence and the Memoirs at Home in the World and The Best of Us. Her latest novel, Count the Ways, the story of a marriage and a divorce and the children who survived it, was published by William Morrow in July 2021 and is now out in paperback. And after this festival, J uh, Joyce will be back at her desk writing a sequel to Count the Ways, which is tentatively scheduled for publication in 2024. She is a fellow of the McDowell Colony in Yaddo, and she is the founder of Write by the Lake, a week-long workshop on the art and craft of memoir held every year since 2001 in Lake Atitlan, Guatemala. And I also recommend following her on Facebook because you'll learn a lot about Guatemala and a lot of other things that happen. So um, here she is. This works, right? Yeah. First, I just want to um, thank the incredible team at this festival. You really do. Um, I've been around a long time. Uh, next year marks the 50th anniversary of the publication of my first book. Um, there aren't too many writers around still <laughs> who were publishing in 1973, but you're looking at one of them. Um, and I've been to a lot of festivals, and congratulations to all of you who make this happen. And I know it's a huge volunteer effort, and, and you've done a fantastic job. And, um, and I love Brattleboro. It's funny, I know I don't need to say this to anybody, to all the Vermonters in this room, but if you, if you come from New Hampshire, people who aren't in this area, in New York or somewhere, will always say, oh, how are things going in Vermont? And I will say, well, I'm sure they're going great, but actually I come from New Hampshire. Um, uh, I love your state too. Um, and I, the novel that, that I'm going to be talking about, actually there, there comes a point in one's writing life where you don't really think I'm just gonna talk about this novel. We'll talk about whatever, but I'll, um, and, and I, I love that. Um, but the, um, this novel is my 10th, Count the Ways. I, um, I do not have a favorite book that I've written any more than I have a favorite of my children. Um, but I have to say this one occupies a very particular space in my life. Um, for anybody who's read my work over the years, the many years, um, the themes and obsessions don't change that much. Um, I have throughout my life looked at um, what I always call the, um, the drama of of relationships, of human relationships. And I've tried to honor the experience that often is very much dismissed in the big important world of finance and business and politics and, and, and global travel, um, the home um, and the family, um, often relegated to the territory of women. I'm glad to see men here. I, when, when men buy this book and they say, well, I'm getting it for my wife, I say, oh, you're, you're not interested in love? Uh, um, um, but I, as much as my obsessions have changed, um, I, I have remained the same, I have changed, of course. This is not a book that I could have written um, 20, 30 years ago, or even probably 10. Um, Count the Ways is the story of a family. Um, the main character is not me, but I would fault nobody for um, supposing that this was my story. The character um, was young at the same point that I was. It follows the, a, a family from the late 1970s when the couple come together, Cam and Eleanor. They meet actually at a craft fair in Vermont. Um, he's got a goat and uh, there's a whole lot of macrame hanging in his booth. Um, 
And it follows them to the, the young years of their marriage, the dream of making a family, um, which was particularly compelling to Eleanor because she didn't come from a solid family. And her obsession is to be part of a happy home. Um, they have three children, as happened in my own life. Um, the, the two people who started it all off drift apart um, and lose sight of each other. Um, and I'm giving away nothing when I say that um, a terrible accident occurs in the family for which Eleanor can never forgive her husband and their, their marriage falls apart. But I was really anxious not to end this story there. I wanted to do something that I hadn't seen in a work of fiction myself, which is to follow a family through its supposed destruction. Um, because the fact is, if two people have children together, um, they are always linked in certain ways. So I follow the children and the two parents for 40 years into the 2000s. This book actually ends in the year 2009. And um, and as, as soon as I'm um, finished enjoying this festival in Brattleboro, I'm driving back home to New Hampshire to pick up with 2010 um, with a sequel. Um, I, um, I'm going to read um, a short passage that um, actually takes place in the book, I think it's probably about the year 1987. And um, Eleanor and Cam have now parted. It's Christmas, and for her, she's a woman who was always obsessed with making a happy family, making, of course, a happy Christmas as we all carry that dream in our heads. But her children are with their father that year, and Eleanor makes the perhaps unwise decision to um, go on a blind date on Christmas Day. Um, I think that's all you need to know. So she makes a long drive. She's, she's made a pie. Um, and now she's just arriving at their house. Russell's sons answered the door. The older one wore thick glasses and the kind of haircut a boy gets when his father, economizing, tries to cut it himself, a bowl cut. He was very thin, his pants held up, but just barely, by a fake leather belt. He was wearing a clip-on Christmas tie that lit up when you pushed a button, which he did. The smaller brother was only slightly less thin, no glasses, but when he stepped forward to greet her, she saw that he had some form of cerebral palsy, mild but recognizable. I'm Arthur, the older one told her. This is my brother, Benny. His umbilical cord was tangled up around his neck when he was born. That's why he walks a little funny. He's not retarded or anything. This was old news to Benny. He paid no attention to the health report. We bought a turkey, he said. Usually we go to the Ramada for Christmas, but my dad said since we were having company, we'd make a feast at home. We got two kinds of dip, Arthur added. Someone had decorated the entrance with a Merry Christmas sign and a cutout of Santa in a disco outfit. Eleanor would not have noticed if the older brother, Arthur, hadn't pointed this out, but they had hung a bunch of mistletoe from the ceiling. Stand here, okay, Benny said. This means my dad gets to kiss you. His speech was a little difficult to understand, but Eleanor figured out what he was saying. Until now, she had not actually laid eyes on her host, but now she saw him, standing a little uneasily, a few feet behind his sons, a pale man of average height and narrow, sloping shoulders, wearing a red and green sweater with a reindeer on the front and a bow tie. He had a regretful air about him, as if he already knew he was a disappointment, but maybe his sons would win her over. Don't worry, he said. I wasn't going to do anything like that. The boys are just excited you're here. Benny led her in, the picture coming to mind of Ricardo Montalban's small sidekick tattoo on Fantasy Island, escorting the week's guest stars off the plane and down the plank leading to the island. 
I love it that this crowd knows my references. <laughs> Russell was no Ricardo Montalban, but he had clearly worked hard to set the stage for her arrival. There were carnations on the table, and though it was daylight out, candles already lit. He had a record playing, The Carpenter's Christmas Portrait. <laughs> Russell asked how her, how her drive had gone. Arthur asked what kind of car she had and concealed his disappointment when she told him Subaru. <laughs> My brother really loves Dodge Chargers, Benny told her. He was hoping you had one, but that's okay. Russell had bought wine and now he poured her a glass, red, a little sweet. I'm not really much of a drinker, he said, but it's a special occasion. Eleanor handed Russell the pie. The boys gathered around to admire it, as if what she had brought were a rare and exotic treasure. This may have been their first homemade pie. You're pretty, Benny said. We were talking about it before you got here, since we didn't know what you'd look like. Arthur said the important part is you're nice, but it's an extra bonus when someone's pretty. <laughs> He turned to Arthur. Doesn't Eleanor look like that girl on the commercial for Diet Coke, the one with the brown hair? He spoke her name. Not everyone you met did that. Arthur gave Benny a look. Don't mind my brother, he said. He's a little crazy. <laughs> Not really, Russell said. Maybe he was worried she'd believe this. Also, he didn't want to hurt Benny's feelings. She had only been in this apartment five minutes, but already she understood this. Russell was looking for a wife. Even more, Russell's sons wanted a mother, and he would do what he could to find them one. If she were up for it, the two of them could be married by Valentine's Day, probably. <laughs> do you have kids? Benny asked. Three. They're with their father today. A worried look came over Benny. Maybe she was another one of those mothers, like his own, who had left. We haven't seen our mom since I was a baby, he said. It turned out we weren't her cup of tea. She wanted to ride around listening to the Grateful Dead. There was probably more to it than that, Benny, Russell said. Your mother loved you. She just had problems being a mom. Do you have problems being a mom? Benny asked Eleanor. She told him she didn't. She could have said more, but this was not the moment. They arranged themselves at the table. Benny made sure Eleanor was sitting next to his father. Arthur held her chair out for, out for her. You taught your boys good manners, Eleanor said. Eagle Scout, he told her. Russell carried in the turkey. From the silver plastic platter on which the meat was arranged, it appeared to have been purchased pre-cooked and pre-sliced, along with disposable plastic bowls of cranberry sauce and gravy. I found this great place that makes everything ready to go, Russell said, but he'd made the sweet potatoes and cornbread from scratch. It's called Stop and Shop, Arthur pointed out. <laughs> they loved her pie. They loved everything about her. Over the course of the meal, the things Benny complimented Eleanor on included her hair, her necklace, her shoes, her baking, her appetite, and when he showed her a patch he'd recently earned at Cub Scouts and asked, asked if she could stitch it on his shirt for him, her sewing ability, along with, related to this, good eyesight, as proven by her care, by her ease in threading the needle. She was sitting at the table sewing on the patch when it came to her what this reminded her of. Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. She was Wendy. A wave of terrible sadness came over her then. These were children without a mother, and she was a mother without children. It should be perfect. More than anything, more even than a man who loved her, Eleanor wanted this back the life of taking care of children the way she used to, living in a family, sharing meals like this. Well, not like this one, but other meals, the good kind. But it was not something you could find in the pages of the classifieds, this family life. 
She wanted it with her own children, not the two sweet, pale strangers who sat across the table from her, their eyes full of unconcealed longing, and in the seat next to her, the sweet, gentle Eagle Scout who would probably love her forever if she gave him the opportunity, which she would not. She had planned to leave as soon as she stitched on the patch and when she handed the shirt back to Benny, but when she handed the shirt back to Benny, he said they had a surprise for her. Let's do our act for Eleanor, he said to Arthur. They had worked up a scene from the Three Amigos movie. His brother looked uneasy. I don't think so, Benny. She probably doesn't want to see it, and anyway, it's kind of lame. His brother, <clears throat> um, Artie's just saying that, Benny told her. You should see my brother's Steve Martin imitation. My dad does the Chevy Chase part. I'm Martin Short. Now Russell was the one looking embarrassed. I only do this because they need a third person, he told Eleanor. I'm not very good at being funny. When I make people laugh, it's usually unintentional. <laughs> Come on, Benny said. With that odd, slightly spastic gait of his, he was clearing a space in the middle of the living room now, his floppy puppet arms flailing. Arthur got up out of his chair to join him. You too, Dad, Benny said. The three of them stood before her then, taking their positions, their best imitations of three men doing their best imitation of cowboys. <laughs> Benny started it off. Hey, you slime-eating dogs, he said, facing the invisible desperados. Hey, you scum-sucking pigs. This was Russell's line. <laughs> he delivered it with unexpected feeling. You sons of a motherless goat. Arthur now. His Steve Martin impersonation was more impressive than Eleanor would have anticipated. He even executed a dance step, more or less. For a second there, Benny stepped out of character, addressing Eleanor. Here's the part where one of the bad guys says, and who are you? You can be him. You can do that part. And who are you? Eleanor asked them. Wherever there is injustice, you will find us, Benny said as Martin Short, the hero mariachi. Wherever there is suffering, we'll be there. The next line was delivered in unison. Clearly, they'd done this before. Though, if Eleanor had to guess, she would say this might have been the first time they had an audience, the first time they performed it for a woman anyway. You will find the three amigos. They took a bow. Eleanor clapped. If this had been an audition, and in some ways it was, you would have had to admit they'd done a good job. There was one more thing they needed to do before she left, Benny told her. It was always Benny taking the lead. Russell and Arthur were probably accustomed to this and grateful for it. Without Benny as the MC, this would have been an excruciatingly quiet gathering. Do you want to see something really special? Who would say no? He took her hand. A little unsteadily, he led her into a small, dark room at the end of the narrow hallway. This was the bedroom of a man for whom a bedroom is nothing more than a place to sleep, a mattress on the floor with a faded spread pulled up over a single pillow, a pile of laundry waiting to be sorted at one end of the room, a plastic storage crate containing a great many white tube socks. On the bureau was a framed black and white picture of a geeky looking wedding, wedding couple, the bride wearing glasses with a broad buck toothed smile, the groom bearing a strong resemblance to Russell, a younger, more hopeful one. There was another picture, Russell with a crew cut, wearing a Boy Scout uniform. He was probably around 15 at the time. You wouldn't believe all the things our dad knows how to do, Benny told her. Astronomy, leather work, insect studies, kayaking, animal husbandry, archery, cooking, any kind of knot you want to make, he can do it. For a moment then, crazily, Eleanor imagined herself in this bed with Russell, a place she would never be. 
She imagined his soft, pale, naked body on the mattress above her, her hands extended behind her head as he demonstrated a particularly elaborate knot that left her powerless to resist him. Benny and Arthur asleep in their beds in the next room, happy in the knowledge they'd found themselves a mom. Now, Benny led her to a bookcase at the far end of the room, piled high with papers and folders, plastic bags full of receipts, an instrument case that suggested it housed a trombone, stacks of old comic books, more tube socks. We never showed this to anyone before, Benny told her, taking down a wooden box. He set it on the bed as a person might some sacred possession a Fabergé egg, the last remaining copy of the Gutenberg Bible, a homemade apple pie, hers. He opened it. At first, she, what she saw looked like just a jumble of rocks, not so different from Toby's back at Cam's house now, though his collection would not be contained in a single box or even 10 of them. They're arrowheads, Benny told her. His voice was hushed as if someone might be listening in, and if so, might steal the precious box. My dad found them in the woods all over Ohio when he was a kid. There's 246 in here. My dad says some of the arrowheads in this box are probably 500 years old. She sat there studying the contents of the box. Nothing she might have said at this moment seemed adequate. It's okay to pick one up, Benny told her. Now he brings us along to look for more. Every weekend we go on an arrowhead finding adventure. We never brought anyone along before, but you could come. That sounds like fun, Eleanor said. There was no need to tell them here today that she would not be joining these expeditions. Someday, our dad will probably donate our collection to a museum, Benny told her. The Smithsonian or someplace like that. He reached into the box. The arrowhead he chose to lift from the pile appeared to be familiar to him. He probably knew every one. He placed it in Eleanor's hand. She wrapped her fingers around it, letting herself take in the sharpness of the stone. She pressed it against her skin, hard enough that it almost hurt. There's nobody else like our dad, he said. He's the best. She studied his face. He could not have tried any harder to win her over. Ten minutes later, she was out on the road again, heading for home, the precious arrowhead on the seat beside her alongside her empty pie dish. It was just after 10 o'clock when she pulled into her driveway, the Christmas lights still on at her neighbor's house. Merry Christmas. You know, I was thinking about um, a question that somebody asked in the last group, I think, having to do with, um, it was asked of Bill, and I think the woman who asked it is still here, Bill Rohrbach, um, about the, um, whether it is presumptuous or appropriative for a writer to um, take on the character, a character who is not like himself or herself or themselves. Um, I've done it all my life. I can't imagine not. It's a fairly recent development that writers are censured as they now are for doing so. Um, I, and I have some pretty strong views on this point that um, as much as I would never appropriate the story of a Native American person from the point of view that I could not know, or a, uh, a, a person of a, of a culture that I had never experienced in any way. Fundamentally, to be a writer, to be a writer of fiction, is to employ imagination and to go beyond our lives. So I loved being those boys and those boys' fathers, and over the course of 10 novels, 
I've been, I've actually been a boy a few times. The, the narrator of my novel, Labor Day, is a, is a, a 33-year-old man reminding, remembering a weekend when he was a 13-year-old boy witnessing his mother's love affair with a convict on the run. I've been a 15-year-old boy who shot the lover of the woman who he was obsessed with, who had seduced him. Um, I've, I've been, uh, it is part of the joy for me of being a fiction writer that I expand my universe, and I hope expand yours. And ultimately, the test is with you, whether we do it badly or well. And you can reject our books if we, if we fail to tell the story well. But I will, I will fight forever for the right of a writer to, to go as far and as, as high and as long as their imagination allows them to go. Um, I, um, I said at the beginning that, that this is not my story, but anybody who, who reads my books, I'm, I'm not suggesting you do this, but if you lined up all 18 books, you'd know a lot about me, and not just from the memoirs. You would know where my obsessions lie, and I go back to them again and again. Um, this book deals again with divorce, and I, I wouldn't have chosen that to be an obsession of mine, but um, it, it divorce shaped a lot of my life and my life as a parent. Um, and I've written, I actually wrote a novel in the 90s. In interestingly, incidentally, I, I don't know that I, I mentioned this to you, Jenny. I, um, I, I used to do this thing because I was writing with kids at home where I would create my own writer's retreat. And I checked into the Riverside Motel uh, back when it was $25 a night, a total dive, um, frequented only by truckers and me. <laughs> And I didn't come out for, basically my children were off on a um, uh, winter vacation, winter break with their dad, and I allowed myself to leave the motel once a day to go and get provisions, and then I would go back, and I, I emerged at the end of that February vacation with the first draft of a novel that became Where Love Goes, which was also about divorce, but it was a 39-year-old woman's story of divorce. Um, and this book is actually the book that I wish I had read when I was that woman. It's, it's a book about um, young love, young passion, the death of a marriage, um, the bitterness and grieving that takes place, um, but a new element that I could not have, have anticipated, which is forgiveness. Um, and I don't think there's any shortcut to getting to that stage without getting old. <laughs> Um, and a lot less, as somebody said yesterday, a lot of things that once seemed so important do not. So this is, this is very much a book about forgiveness. Um, it's also a book about American culture. And I, I'm so looking forward to having some back and forth with you, Kirthina, because I, this couple, this family does not live in a vacuum. They are, in fact, why don't you come on up here? It's, they're, they're living, uh, you know, when the novel starts, the Vietnam War is on, and the Watergate hearings, and over the course of the many years, um, they lived through events both very large, there's a moment when the seven-year-old seven daughter goes off with her whole school to you know, watch the challenger go up, she, and she's completely obsessed with, with that event, and we all know what happened. Um, and also very small events that, um, and music. There's a, an absolute soundtrack to this book as there, as there is to every one of my books. So I, I loved hearing about your, maybe we'll just sort of pull up a chair and Sounds good. see what, what's on everybody else's mind. <laughs> Um, and, and if you, I always hope you have questions, or maybe we should stand, I don't know. Um, I always hope that they're questions because um, my books are only half of my uh, of the experience of a novel. Um, and you're the other half. And I so look forward to the conversation. To, for those of you who've read this book, um, Kirthina's book, other books of, of Mine, I guess this is your first. first. Um, um, fire away, um, and and if you don't, we'll just we'll just oh, we could just chat. chat. <laughs> <laughs> and I could talk about playlists too. <laughs> I had one for this book, but please don't be shy. They don't let me out all that often, and when they do, it's very exciting. <laughs> and in fact, the last this is my last 
sort of foray into the world before I do another thing like the Riverside Motel, where I just go and hole up and, and um, finish the sequel to the, this novel. Can I actually ask you a question? About Absolutely. That? I would love to know why and when you were inspired to write a sequel to this novel. Um, I hadn't intended to, that's a great question, thank you. Um, I hadn't intended to do this, and, and if I had, I would have done some things differently. I would have planted some stuff in the first one that I could, you know, reap later on. Although it works pretty well without that, but um, I, um, without giving away what happens in the book, um, Eleanor's, Eleanor's life is not finished. A particular chapter of her life is, is over. She's, the, the book, um, both begins and ends, it's sort of bookended by the wedding of her oldest child, who um, was born as a daughter, but transitions um, to become her son. Um, and it is sort of the end of her stage of, you know, good parents work themselves out of a job. Um, she's not, as a woman who was constantly sacrificing herself for her children, caring for children, worrying about children, trying to protect children. She cannot do this anymore. They are out on their own. So I heard from a lot of readers who wanted to know what happened next. And some readers, I will say, and there may or may not be um, somebody in this category here today, but if you have read the book, a lot of a lot of readers were quite angry with my character, and I I probably got a letter ten times to the effect of you know I just threw that book down on the floor. They they picked it up again later I will say, but um, because Eleanor makes some really poor choices in her life, and I will say as a fiction writer, if all of our characters made exemplary choices, the books would be very short and rather boring. Um, so I needed to give Eleanor another chapter. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I actually relate to that because I got I received a lot of feedback on this novel where readers will say, I did not like your main character. I didn't like any of the characters, but I loved the book anyway. And I was thought, well, I guess I did my job because like you said. It's not our job to make likable characters. Yeah. It's to make real characters. Real I mean, characters. I, I do, I have to say, I don't, I don't believe in making a villain. I don't think I have ever made, I have, I have had many characters in my books, my, my memoir as well, my two memoirs as well as, as my novels who, who inflict some terrible damage and wounds on, on characters. But I, probably one of the lessons that I have taken from 25 years of teaching women memoir is that everybody has a story. And once you know their story, therein lies the root to understanding and forgiving. Um, so yeah, I, um, there, I'm thinking again about the question about actually the sensitivity reader. You know, when I, the, um, the part of the, uh, this is not a book about um, having a non-binary child or a child who actually transitions, becomes a man, not non-binary. Um, but as in life, lots of things happen in a family. And one of the children in this family makes this decision and makes this decision not now, but in the year 2000. Um, the book was given to a sensitivity reader, and the sense, actually to several sensitivity readers. This is a new phenomenon. If you're looking for a great job, um, <laughs> you, you might not qualify. You have to have something that you could be on the alert for, but um, maybe offending Vermonters, I don't know. The cheese collective, uh, making sure that um, foliage is properly portrayed. But, but uh, there was, and I don't want to joke about it, I think it's important to have this, but also to recognize where it begins and ends. The sensitivity reader who was herself, themselves, sorry, um, non-binary, came back and said, um, Joyce's uh, character is transphobic because the mother in the year 2000 hearing that her daughter was going to transition to become her son, was not just joyful. <laughs> well, we are portraying life. And part of what I wanted to portray was the mother's gradual learning and understanding. There are some tragedies in this book, but that is not one of them. Um, and I, I have to say, I'm, I'm disturbed, and more than disturbed, um, at the idea of what could be happening to literature as, as uh, our work is red pencil that way. I didn't allow it to be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for both of you regarding yeah. the editorial process, meaning 
you finish the book and you turn it in, and then, and then what happens? Um, the, the question was, um, what happens after you finish the book and turned it in? You want to go sure. for it? So as a debut author, um, again, like I said earlier, this is my third attempt at a novel in 20 years. So I spent a lot of time making sure it was as good as it possibly could be. I had a lot of readers, people, both fellow writers and just friends as well. And after two years of writing and revision, <laughs> lots of revision, um, that's when you find a literary agent to represent your work. So for me, the process is really a lot of writing, a lot of revision, a lot of taking time with the book. This used to be about 120,000 words, and I had to cut it down to 107,000 words because I'd never written a book this before with so many characters. There's a, it's a multi-generational story, so I had to balance out not just my protagonist's story, but also the other characters, meaning her children and her grandchildren. So once I had an agent and she you know, sent, submitted my book to publishers, and then I worked with my editor. Um, and that's, is that answer your question? Sorry, I mean, like, what, what, how does your, what's, I'd like to, I'm interested in the relationship each of you established with an editor and how that, conversation goes back and forth. Sure. So once my book had an editor, one of the things she talked to me about was the idea of, well, here's the interesting thing. I wrote this book before the pandemic, and it's set in 2044. And so once I, I sold my book April 1st, 2020, so I had to find a way to in, uh, integrate the pandemic without making it the overarching point of the novel, especially because at that time, we just didn't know what was going to happen with the pandemic. So that's where an editor is really helpful and influential in trying to, you know, we work together and find a way to integrate um, how to mention the pandemic without making the pandemic the story of this novel. By circumstance, actually, uh, Daba's husband passes away in 2020. That was how I wrote it before I submitted it <laughs> to my agent and editor. So I had to find an organic way to still have that take place, but not have it be pandemic related, but still have it integrated into the story for in a meaningful way. Um, I'm also working with my editor on my second book, which is coming out next spring. And it's just so important to have that kind of editor who knows your writing at that point very well and can point out your strengths and your weaknesses, what to augment, what to add, what to give more clarification, including character, or character arcs and motivations and also what to condense because I can go on and on about my favorite parts of pop culture and she knows how to kind of bring me in. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And are you a writer yourself? No. Uh, um, I have to say that I have internalized so many editors at this point that, um, you know, this isn't sort of me saying, oh, well, I'm so great, I don't need an editor, but I almost hear their voices as I am writing now. Um, for anybody who's read my memoir, At Home in the World, um, you will understand that probably there's no voice that speaks louder in my head still 32 years after her death than my mother, who really was the one who, who taught me how to write. I'm, I sit before you as a non-MFA graduate, college dropout, but I, I was raised in a boot camp of writing, something I don't recommend and did not replicate with my children. But um, So I don't have a lot of editorial back and forth. Um, I do, I've, at this point, I anticipate, I think, what the issues will be. Um, I read out loud. That's very important to me. And I, and I will say that this book had a, a, had a very unique history in my writing life. I, um, I began it in the summer of 2018. Um, and I worked really hard to, to have a finished first draft of this book in the summer of 2018 because I was going back to college. I had dropped out of college. Um, 48 years earlier, and I was going back to Yale University as a sophomore, and I knew I was not going to be able to work on my book. So I created a, a first draft of the book and then didn't look at it for nine months, which has never happened. But actually, I now think it was a huge gift to have that book just sort of sit and be a new experience when I picked it up again when classes ended in May. And so then in the summer of 2019, I pretty much rewrote the whole book because I was a different person, incidentally informed by a year with young Yale students. Um, that's really where the, where the transgender piece of the story came because I, I began to experience so much of what that meant for so many young people of now. Um, and then once again, school started and I put the book again away again. And then it was March of 2020 and I went down to once a year and now more than once a year, but it was once a year. I, I host a rather extraordinary gathering for women 
to help them tell their story. It, um, and it, it's really about having had myself the experience of being told that I could not tell my story, that mine was a forbidden story. Again, if you know the backstory of my memoir at home in the world, I was very much a canceled writer for many, many years for presuming to tell the story of an experience with a very famous, very important, very revered, much older man when I was young, um, and called a predator. Uh, in 1998 for doing so. So I was going down to Guatemala to host my annual memoir workshop, knowing that people might not come, but I wanted to be there for whoever showed up. Amazingly, eight did show up. The airport shut down. There were no planes flying. I There I was with eight women gathered at my home on the shores of Lake Atitlan in this little Mayan village telling stories and working on stories. And eventually the US Embassy sent a plane and I knew they would and took them home. But I invited two young ones who were 32 at the time to stay with me. And that's when I reopened the manuscript of what became Count the Ways and completely rewrote it again. And this time, I have to say, my editors were those two young women. I read out loud. Every day I worked really, really hard. And every night, I, we sat out under the stars, looking out at the lake and the volcano. Uh, it's a New England story, very far from Guatemala. Um, but I read out loud to those two women. And it is such a helpful thing to have a person who is not your best friend or your husband or you, you know, a, um, possibly somebody in your writing group. But in my case, I had these two wonderful young women. And I, they really were the ones who who led me through what became the final manuscript of this book. Yeah. Hi. Um, I would just like to know more about your writing process. Um, when you write, like what you read, uh, when, you're, when you're writing, do you write in the morning? Do you write for like two weeks at a time? Like anything you want to share? Um, sure. So for this book, um, I wrote book, two books previous to this. And when I wrote those books, I kind of made up the story as I went along, which is one of the reasons why I don't think it was they were ultimately successful. So I wanted to change my process before I wrote this book, especially because I had so many characters and it was set 20 years in the future and I had all these different elements that I didn't know if it would quite work. So I did a lot of work ahead of before writing even the first page of this novel. I did an entire outline, so I outlined the entire novel chapter by chapter, so I knew exactly what would happen from beginning to end. I did a character spreadsheet where I kind of mapped the arcs of every single character in the novel, uh, figured out the personality quirks, the relationship to Dava, my, my main character, and what the arc of their story would be throughout the novel. And then finally, I wrote a chronology of Dava's life from beginning to end, so I knew all the important milestones in her life and when they would take place because the novel spans so much of her lifetime, basically 70 years. And I found that by doing all that work ahead of time, before I even started writing the first chapter of this book, made all the difference for me. Um, I like to call this book like the greatest creative, the great creative joyous experience of my life because it was just so much fun to write. Um, it was everything I was ever interested in, but also because I did that work, I never floundered when it came to my, sit at my laptop every day. I always knew exactly what I was writing about. I always knew what was ahead of me, and that made all the difference for me. So I did that for my second book as well. Um, I will have certain times of day. Sometimes I work well in the morning. Sometimes I work well at night. The funny thing about me and my writing process is you might be able to tell I'm very pop culture oriented. So for book number one, I listened to a lot of music, a lot of albums, especially when I was trying to figure out what music would be important in Daba's life. So that was really helpful to me. The second book, a lot of it was written because you know, during the pandemic, we had to stay indoors. So I, I missed the chatter of a coffee shop. I love going to write in coffee shops, but I missed like, the conversation. I need the noise. So I watched a lot of television, and I had television in the background constantly while writing my second book. And it actually made a lot of difference for me um, and kind of soaked into my book as well. I named a character in my second novel after a character I was watching on a TV show. So I feel like for me, every process will be different for every book, and I kind of have to figure it out while I'm doing it. I love it that we are, we're going to give completely different <laughs> answers here, <laughs> which just goes to show there is no one answer, of course, and there is no one magic time of day or writing program or kind of pencil. Or, um, but I don't have a clue what's going to happen. And I never, every novel that I've embarked on, um, and I've actually, I've published 10 a few times, I've gotten partway through and said no, but um, part of what gets me 
out of bed at five in the morning and racing to work is that I'm my own first reader and I want to find out what's going to happen. And I, I, part of what keeps me alive and excited is not knowing. That said, I do know who my characters are. I don't discover on page 200 that somebody that I thought was um, a deeply honorable ethical person has in fact been um, embezzling funds from the family business. I know who the people are and rather as it is with our children, we give birth to them and for a brief period we actually think we control what happens in their lives but we know very soon that they lead the way and we see what what they're going to do and we watch i feel that way about my characters that i've given birth to these people some of them are already old when i when i meet them but um and then if i know who they are, what they want, what their issues are, what their problems are, they lead me to the story. I, um, I think I was, in the case of this book, I was probably, actually, in the case of most books, I'm thinking about my novel Labor Day. I, I had this massive manhunt for the, the convict on the run, and the woman and the man were going to run off to Canada together, and the boy was uh, letting his father know that he'd never see him again, and, and the police were circling, and, and the people were in love, and they were good people, and there was a pie in the oven, and how on earth am I going to resolve this? I did not know. Um, but I knew who those people were, and they led me to it. I, um, I, do, I do not outline... I do have a giant whiteboard, mm. and the whiteboard doesn't is not in neat columns. I, there's nothing neat about the process of making a work of fiction, um, but I scribble a lot of random things on it, so I just won't be totally alone with a blank computer, you know. And I certainly know what year somebody was born. I know that Toby, the son, pop culture is important to me too, as I mentioned to you. I, Toby was born right around when John Lennon was shot. I have very sort of distinct markers for what's going on, not just in the family, but in the world. Um, their marriage ends the day the cha challenger explodes, and there's a reason for that. Um, um, so for me, you know, they always say, um, write what you know, but I would add, write what you don't know and you want to discover. Um, my novel, To Die For, was inspired by a, a very notorious crime case going on in New Hampshire at the time that Pamela Smart um, had enlisted the aid of her 15-year-old lover to kill her husband. Even, I had been a journalist once, and even had I been able to get an interview with those people, they were not going to tell me what they did, why they did it. I felt my clearest route to understanding, and it was not a book about Pamela Smart, but it was, I wanted to grapple with some of those situations was to create characters who would tell me, and they did. And by the time I got to the scene where the boy is picking up the gun and shooting the husband who he's never met, point blank, I knew that boy. And he wasn't a villain. He wasn't a terrible person. He did a terrible thing. Um, but my characters lead me to my story. Oh, more questions, please. Yes. Um, hi. hi. Joyce, you have a few books that were turned into films. Yeah. You, um, your options by HBO Max and Congrats. Thank you. So I was wondering, Joyce, for you, how involved did you want to be and were you able to be in those? And for you, same question, do you know what your involvement is going to be and are you guys ever concerned about how they're going to portray your work? <laughs> Has yours started yet? Is yours uh, underway? It's still in process. Yeah. What I've learned personally, this is all very, it takes a long time. It's all very slow in development. Um, Luckily, you're young. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a worry for me. Um, but I think, you know, I think I would like to be involved. I think I have a really great relationship with the production company who optioned it. Um, I think they actually have done a wonderful job in kind of incorporating my feedback and comment and the things that are most important to me. And, you know, when I was growing up, I never really saw myself on television. I didn't know what that experience would be like. So the idea that this might actually become a television show and maybe give, like, I think of the show Never Have I Ever. 
um, on Netflix. And the idea that kind of show was so popular and it gave such amazing roles to actresses who might not have had the opportunity. I hope if Dava becomes a TV show, it can give similar opportunities to actors who would love to see themselves represented on screen. For me, that's the great gift of writing this novel, which is the idea that if this becomes a television series, it might give opportunity for representation, especially if the idea that the main character of a TV show is an older Indian American woman. That's just not happen, yeah. if at all. So whoop, that means a lot to Except me. Except on Indian Matchmaker, which happens to be a, an obsession of mine. <laughs> right. But, that, that's, but that's, you know, that's more of a documentary series. Yes. But you're right. That's yeah. very true. So to have that be, you know, in a television series, um, this gets comped a lot or compared a lot to Succession, which I think is amazing. And I love the idea of a woman like Dava on television who's so uncompromising and knows what she wants and she's ambitious and she is very... Um, very proud to be the head of a family and doesn't take anyone's crap. And I don't feel like I've ever really seen a character like her on television. And I know the production company, Veritas, who's options and knows how important it is to me to have that represent on screen. And so my hope, if it does reach the small screen, that I can be involved in, in some way, maybe in the writer's room. And once again, my answer will be very different. But I understand <laughs> why right. you would in particular, given that you want actors who are Indian actors, and you have a very particular cultural protectiveness. Um, so much of my life these days, and as I've grown older, is about letting go things that I thought I could control that I now know I can't. And to me, having a book made into a film is a prime example of that. Um, you had better, I'm in charge of my book, and I don't want anybody telling me um, to change my book. I mean, my editor I'll work with, but, but. The film is the, is, is the directors and the screenwriters and that whole team's artwork, and I stay pretty clear from them. To Die For was, if any of you have seen it, it's a fabulous movie. I happen to think it's maybe Nicole Kidman's best role, and the screenplay was written by Buck Henry, who did become a friend. But, but basically, I wish them well and, and say, go with God. Um, I felt very strongly in Labor Day, there's a scene where the character of the convict, played by Josh Brolin, um, has to uh, teach the son, the 13-year-old son of the woman that he's hiding out with and who he's fallen in love with and who's fallen in love with him, how to make a pie. And I did insist. Here I had control. I, it was part of the contract that I would teach Josh Brolin how to make that pie. And if you watch that movie, that is my pie. It's, I wanted the pie to look, it's a great pie, but it looks, it doesn't look like a Hollywood pie. It looks like a pie made by a convict on the run. And I made sure that Josh Brolin made it right. It was, I suffered through the pie lesson with him. Um, but I, I, I ultimately feel, I hope it goes well, but I let it go. My uh, audiobooks, on the other hand, I'm completely controlling of. And I, I record all my audiobooks, and with the exception of Labor Day, which needed a male voice. And I happen to have a son who's an actor, so he did that one. But, but um, um, I, I let it go. Mm -hmm. I have a very small role in To Die For. I play Nicole Kidman's lawyer. And I Amazing. Watch <laughs> that film. You'll see a younger version of me with a few lines. Labor Day was filmed in Shelburne Falls and in Concord, Concord Mass, yeah. Yes? Um, for you, I, well, you mentioned that your previous novels didn't work because you didn't have an outline, and I just wondered what happened. <laughs> Um, so the first book I wrote was my thesis for, I went to Emerson College in Boston for graduate school, and so that was my thesis project. And I love the novel, but I feel like I kind of wrote myself into a narrative plot hole that I couldn't figure out. And as much as I worked on it, I just couldn't figure out how to make it work. And a part of me thinks it's because I didn't kind of think through the entire arc of the story. In that case, for my second novel, I mean, I finished a complete draft and then it was a YA novel. And so when it came time to revise it, I found myself bored by it. And if I'm bored as a writer, then you'll be yes. bored as a reader. <laughs> Good so I thought, choice. <laughs> let me move on from it. So those are the reasons why I moved on from both those books. And I will, I will say, as a person who's thrown out a number of almost finished novels, um, and not because they were badly written, no daughter of my mother is going to write badly, um, but they weren't 
good enough for you. And the boredom thing was, yeah. you know, if I ever fell asleep at my laptop, really bad sign. Um, but every time I did, for, for any writer in this room who's had that experience, and I, I bet it's true for you, uh, Christina, every time I've thrown something out, the next thing was really strong. And I think it was because I was freed. I was no longer weighed down by this book that I just didn't, wasn't really working. And suddenly I, I took flight. And, and often wrote really fast the next thing after laboring yeah. long. Yeah. Yes. I just, I'm kind of curious about, um, you wrote a memoir, you write fiction and then you wrote a memoir. How was that process different? How did you approach yourself as a character? I'm, I'm, always, I'm always a storyteller. The question was, um, how is it possible to be both a writer of fiction and memoir? Um, I have published um, two, some would say three, three memoirs, but I don't call the, mem the book that I published when I was 18 a memoir because I was still being a good girl. I was still being careful and not talking about the difficult parts of my life or the, the, you know, the embarrassing parts um, that my father was an alcoholic. That was a central formative event of our family. Um, circumstance of our family that I didn't talk about. Um, but whether it's something that happened to me or something that I invent, the characters are equally real to me. Um, so it's less different than you think. It is still fundamentally storytelling and the bar is no less uh, is no lower for memoir. I still want to keep you turning the pages in the middle of the night and have your heart beat stronger. It, and it's one of the lessons that I, that I try to impart on students wh who I work with, and it's my labor of love that I do this at whatever level, um, that a memoir is not the story of my life. Here's what happened. It is giving shape and finding meaning and locating the, the, the tension and the drama and, and the discovery and the redemption um, in our own stories. So they're all, I, I, I will probably go back and forth always, although I, I've written many more novels than memoir at this, um, at this point. I, I love it that I get to do both. Thank you. We probably only have time for maybe one more question. Are there any more? If not, you will be signing books here. No? Thank you Thank for you coming. So what a joy.